Well, welcome to As in Heaven Season 3. My name is Jim Davis. I'm your host and pastor of Orlando Grace Church, and I'm joined by my co-host and dear friend, Michael Aitchison, who serves as the lead pastor and planter of Christ United Fellowship here in Orlando. And today we have the privilege of being joined by Dr. Erwin Entz. Erwin serves as the coordinator of Mission to North America with the PCA and serves as an adjunct professor of pastoral theology for Reformed Theological Seminary and he resides in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And if you visit D.C. and drop in on a CrossFit class, you may well find Irwin to be your coach. Uh, fun fact, Irwin, you, uh, you've been on our podcast now more than anyone else. We had you on twice last season, once by yourself, and then we did that live episode with you and Tim Keller at the TGC National Conference uh, I think about Saturday Night Live, where I think you get like a special coat if you host a certain number of times. And and Mike, uh, Mike and I feel like we should have a special coat here for Irwin. Uh, Jim, I agree 100%. In fact, I think we should name it the Instacoat. Wait for it. The Instacoat. Or the As It Ints in Heaven Award. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Doc, you have been such an encouragement from near and far to so many of us, and I, I can say that personally, and also to our church. And you've been a blessing to us through your preaching and your writings, and we're just so grateful to have you on here with us once again. And I just want to add, Doc is just a really cool dude. I mean, if you get a chance to hang out with him, you will notice that he has what I like to call Sanctified swag. Oh, Lord. <laughs> sanctified swag. <laughs> if you're going to have swag, that's the swag to have, the sanctified That's swag. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you've also, we, us living in the RTS Orlando community, you've been such a blessing. And we, Mike and I both have a number of RTS students here who um, consistently tell us how blessed they are by the classes that you teach there and the ways that you invest and in preaching in churches around Orlando. So we, we really appreciate that too. Thank you. Well, as we look at this new era that we're living in, that, that we're calling the great dechurching, you know, through the course of this podcast, I think we've identified the problem effectively, but often th that's the easier thing to do. The way forward in many of these, these issues can be much harder than just identifying the issue. And that's what we feel like you're especially equipped to do. So we want to talk about the need to be biblically faithful if we're going to be biblically fruitful. And, and the way we've been phrasing this is being both missional and confessional instead of uh, feeling like we need to choose uh, one over the other. So my first question is if we define being confessional as being clear about what we believe or what it is we confess, and if we define being missional as engaging the context we're in the way that Jesus wants us to, then how do you observe churches embracing one of those at the expense of the other? M maybe leaning into the doctrine at the expense of the mission or leaning into what they would call the mission without building uh, the, the proper doctrinal foundation foundation and what problems does that create? Yeah, well, this is it's, a, it's an important question because to uh, to separate or um, uh, to to look at being confessional and being missional as substant, uh, substantively different is, is a false dichotomy. They are one and the same. If I'm if I am, if I'm confessional, then I must be missional. <laughs> um, and it, when we're talking about being biblical, right? If if I am if I'm missional, what's driving that mission is it is my ultimate confession of who Christ is, right? That's the point, <laughs> right? We we get to join in God's mission. It's not ours. Is is God's mission for His purpose? that when we confess Christ as Lord, we get joined in on that mission, right? As the Father sent me, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, so, so I send you, right? And so, and so we, the, the, we, we can find churches making this false dichotomy in this way. In one sense, people uh, can have uh, the notion that the most important thing 
that we do as a church is declare what we believe. That that at the at the top of the mountain of priorities is to say that we believe the scriptures to be the word of God, that we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And yes, and amen. <laughs> All right. Um, and 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 thinking that that actually is just enough, but but it's it's not enough in the sense that who are we declaring it to? <laughs> are we just declaring it to each other? Yes, discipleship, right? We need to we need to hear the word again and again. We never right grow out of that. Right? Um, and so when you have a, a false dichotomy between confession and, and mission, um, then you can think that as long as we are saying the right words to each other, we are being faithful. And, and that the message of the gospel, the proclamation of the good news never goes beyond our community, beyond our walls. We don't. We don't actually get involved in the mess of missional ministry. Missional ministry is messy, right? And on the other side of the spectrum, when we might say um, people are are prioritize mission mission and being missional, and here's what I mean by that. The outward activity, <laughs> the, the 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 being present in the cultural milieu, the right, uh, the engaging the issues of the day. Um, we we don't do well if we neglect the fact that the point of being missional is to point to Jesus <laughs> as the Lord. <laughs> The point of the mission is to point to him as the solution. The point of engaging issues of justice and righteousness in the public square is to say that Jesus Christ is the one whose throne uh, is founded on justice and righteousness. <laughs> That's why it matters. And so, uh, and so this false dichotomy, on the one hand, let me just uh, uh, wrap it this way. Uh, my, one of my favorite people and theologians and professors, Dr. John Frame, whom you all know well, and I learned this from him when I was a seminary student at RTS, and he, his definition for theology, right? He says, theology is the application of the word of God by people to every facet or aspect of life. That that there's a doing to theology. It's not just a thinking and a believing <laughs> to theology. There's an acting, right? And so we, and then what happens is, this is the last thing I'll say, we pit ourselves against each other in the church, <laughs> right? We make accusations that, oh, those are the missional people who don't care about doctrine, uh, and theology, who are wishy-washy, who are on a, a slippery slope. Or then we'll say, well, those are, you know, the doctrinalist people. Those are the uh, confessional people who don't care about loving neighbors. Right? And we make caricatures, actually, of one another that, that, um, that do damage, actually, to the witness of the church. So I'll stop there. We could go on, but I'll stop there. Well, Doc, I, I appreciate th how you're calling us to break this false dichotomy and to see the synthesis there. And I, if I could, I want to lean into both ends of the spectrum and ask you to elaborate on a little bit more on what it means to be doctrinally faithful. For example, um, it's not just enough to be non-heretical. We need to lean into being extremely biblical or it's not just enough to be a non-racist, but we need to be deeply devoted to biblical ethics. Can you lean into both of those categories 
uh, for us in that regard. Yeah, that that's right. Again, it comes down to this fundamental question, and this is why this is why the language of mission is so important. Uh, the language of mission is so important because, again, it's not us. It's not our mission. It is not the mission. We, you know, we every church right comes. Here's our mission statement. <laughs> yeah, I got it right here. And so I'm not. I'm not saying we don't make mission statements, <laughs> right? And I'm, not, I'm not saying we don't. Uh, now, you know, there's no call in scripture for uh, for us to come up with a mission statement for our church or for our ministry, right? That's not a biblical mandate or requirement, but it is helpful, right? in a common grace sort of way, right? And so, so we can do it, but, but we have to understand that, that, that mission is an active word. It is, it, is, it is about how we are living. And so, so for example, to use your, your, your point, it's not enough to, to be, okay, let me, non-heretical. Let me let me go to my confession, okay? All right, the Westminster Confession of Faith, right? Uh, with its larger and shorter catechisms, the Westminster divines in the 1640s rightly did this when they were writing the larger catechism, questions and answers about the Ten Commandments, and they said it. They did it rightly. They said, right, in the commandments where a sin is forbidden. The opposite duty is required, right? right? And where a duty is required, the opposite sin is forbidden. And so when the commandment says, you shall not murder, the questions are not simply, oh, I did not take the life of anyone uh, unjustly, or I did, not, um, I did not murder someone in my heart or in my thoughts, the confession rightly understands that the missional call <laughs> is that we are promoters of life, that we that we we obey the yeah. commandment by being pro-life, <clears throat> pro all of life. And that is activity, right? That's not just by word, but it's by what we do. Right. And so, and so this is rooted. So, so right, there's your connection between being confessional and being missional. Right? Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the confession itself is a missional document. And, and so, you know, in, in my context at Orlando Grace Church, um, we have the Second London Confession. So th they took all the brilliance of the Westminster and just made it a little more biblically faithful. <laughs> I'm messing with you. All right, so we, uh, we had a class where we walked through the Second London Confession and, and we talked about how it is a missional document. And so, you know, our cards on the table, we have been a church that is, that, that is more on the confessional side, wanting to build the mission out. But then I have friends who are pastors, good, well-meaning, godly people, um, but they would be more on the other side and say, yeah, well, we're not going to address certain issues in church. We're not going to teach certain doctrines because it could push people away and hinder the mission. What, what would you say to that person, that pastor? Um, so I'd say a few things. On the one hand, I understand, I understand this wrestling with the doctrine of the spirituality of the church, because that's that's really where this conversation has its kind of roots and origins in terms of that the that the church is the the at the what is given to the church are matters of the spirit. <laughs> Are right that the church is not involved in civic affairs, so to speak. Right now, I think there's a there's an unhelpful gra an unhelpful gra uh, um, uh, perspective on the spiritual spirituality of the church that says that the church doesn't ever say anything <laughs> about matters in the civic arena or matters that relate to government affairs and that's not what it means <laughs> it means right we're we don't go try to run the government right we don't try to run our local politics <laughs> right that's that's not our that's not 
our calling. But we are always, we are always the voice of Christ, the prophetic witness for righteousness and justice in the world. So I would say, secondly, then, we try to be, yes, we want to be winsome as we engage congregants and others, but we don't lead from a position of fear. Yeah. Of offend. I, That's really good. I don't, in my flesh, in my personality, I'm afraid of offending people. <laughs> right? I'm a... I'm more naturally wired as less confrontational. <laughs> um, well, I can appreciate that. I, I joke around here. My, my, the way God has made me, well, and I would even say in my flesh, especially, I'm, I'm really a small town mayor. I just want everybody to get along. I, I, that's what I want. I learned the hard way in 2020 and 2021 that, that you can't lead that way, but that's, that's how I want to operate. That's right. That's right. And so, and so what I'm, from a from a filled with the spirit vantage point, what I want to prioritize is not so much concerned that people get offended, but that the point of offense is God's word and its implications yeah. for how we live, not just my opinion, <laughs> right? And so the gospel offends. Where do, if we, right if you can't live as a Christian and take any okay, right? Any Christian who says, I can read through the entirety of the scriptures and never be personally offended by what I read there is not giving you an honest <laughs> reflection <laughs> <laughs> of what they have found in the scriptures. Because the scriptures is always confronting us. So God's word is always confronting us where our fleshly worldly, cultural commitments are taking priority over God's kingdom priorities and commitments, right? And so, so we, as a pastor, as a leader, I don't want to be afraid of offending. I want to be concerned not to offend people with my opinion, but let the word of God do its offense. Do its offending with the spirit of God. Do the offending as as I and we strive to be faithful to Christ and His Word. Well, let's take. The, I love what you're saying. Let's take this down to what we might call the ground level, because one of the things that you do so well, whether it's in your seminary classes or in your book, The Beautiful Community is you begin with the important doctrines like the doctrine of God, the Trinity, doctrine of sin, and others, but you don't stop there. You apply it to the church, but then you don't stop there either. You then help us to see how that doctrine should fuel the mission of every church. So could you could you just give an example of what that looks like? Maybe pick a doctrine, help us to see how orthodoxy, what we believe, should drive the orthopraxy, what we practice, specifically in our mission to the world. Yeah. So, so we'll take this at uh, at three three phases or levels, right? And um, and you might you might um, not be surprised that I'm going to start with the doctrine of the Trinity, um, which you know, for me, I is, am not, and I'm pleased you did. <laughs> foundational. For so much of our practice in this language that we get from Jesus, from the scriptures, and from our Lord in the scriptures, what is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, with all your might. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When these two, right, are, are, are based all the prophets and the law. The doctrine of the Trinity, that God is eternally existent in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God of grace. The one God. God is the very embodiment and epitome of unity and diversity, diversity in unity. as 
my favorite theologian, Herman Bavink, says, right, in God, too, there is unity and diversity, diversity and unity. Indeed, this order and this harmony is present in him absolutely, <laughs> right? Right? And this makes for what he says, the most perfect kind of community, a community uh, of the same beings, and it simultaneously makes for the most perfect diversity, a diversity of divine persons. And this theological truth, this foundational truth about who is the God that we worship, also answers this question, who are we called to be? Because the first thing that the word of God says about humanity from God's mouth is let us make humanity in our image according to our likeness. So we were made by God to image him as unity and diversity, diversity and unity. We are not made to be isolated individuals, right? Um, Bavink, again, as you all know, I quote, <laughs> right? It says, right, the image of God is much too rich for it to be fully realized in a single human being, however richly gifted that human being may be. It can only be somewhat unfolded in its depths and riches in a humanity counting billions of members. <laughs> right? He says, only humanity in its entirety, as one complete organism, summed up under a single head, he's talking about Jesus Christ, spread out over the whole earth as prophet proclaiming the truth of God, as priest dedicating itself to God, as ruler controlling the earth and the whole of creation, only it is a fully finished image, the most telling and striking likeness of God. You want to have in your mind's eye what it means for humanity to be the image of God? you got to have the end of the story in view. You, you've got to have all of redeemed humanity in the new heaven and earth in all of its diversity as he says, as one complete organism, not a uniform organism, but every tongue and tribe and people and language, right, before the throne. Now, that's fundamental theology doctrine and its implication for us. And it comes down to practice and how then do we live? If this is true, First, as God's redeemed people, how then do we live? This drives so much of what we see in the scriptures. And we could talk about John 17 and Jesus' high priestly prayer about our oneness, um, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'm going to go to what Paul says to the Colossians. He's, he's Colossians chapter 3. The apostle is talking to a diverse church. He says to them in verse 11 of Colossians 3, here, Colossians, in the church, there isn't Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. He could say that to them because that's who's in the church. You've got this, you've got this now group of people who would not be together apart from Jesus Christ. Greek and Jew, barbarians, enslaved people, free people, in one body. And now he says, well, here's what you do, right? He says, put on then, since this is true of you, put on then as God's chosen ones. You are the elect, you diverse people. Put on then as God's chosen ones, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another, as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. And above all these things, he says, put on love that binds everything together in perfect harmony. Your life, he's saying, together. Why does he have to say, put on compassionate hearts? <laughs> Patience. Meekness. Bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Because what does it look like for these people who, apart from Christ, wouldn't have no relationships, no kind of intimate, loving communion together, right? This is an outflow of the doctrine of the Trinity. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll let you ask another question, 
is going back to being confessional. Chapter 6, 26 of the Westminster Confession uh, of Faith is of the communion of saints. The, the obligations that God's people have because we're united by faith to Jesus Christ, we're united to one another in love, the obligation that we have to one another. It says we participate in each other's gifts and graces, and we're obligated to perform the public and private duties that make for our mutual good inwardly and outwardly. It's it's our duty to come to the aid of one another, both spiritually and materially, as uh, as according to our various abilities. And then it says, as God affords opportunity, this communion is to be extended to all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Right? Robert Lethem, in his book, The Westminster Assembly, he's writing about this, he says this about this chapter. Rightly so, that the, the Westminster divines are basing this on um, our union with Christ, which, which implies and makes for our union with one another. But he says, right, he says that this communion is actually an overflow of the doctrine of the Trinity. There's union and unity, but in diversity. The Westminster divines, they understood this. And so we have to live this out, and we live it out as witnesses to the world. Because what the world should see in the church is a union and a reconciliation across all kinds of polarizing, fractured, dividing lines. You should not be able to say, in the United States of America, when you look at any congregation, that's a red church, that's a blue church. That church leans more to Republican politics. That church leans more to a Democratic poli Demo uh, Democrat Party politics. That should not be the defining characteristic of any congregation of our Lord. You should actually see the union and unity across political divides. <laughs> in congregations. All right, I'm going to stop there. Well, we can go ahead and, and take up the offering, but, <laughs> but, but Doc, we, we've, we've got to get you to lean in a little bit more in the Christological category now, since you've so eloquently given us the implication, the nature and implications of the Trinity. Can you help us understand uh, what are the implications of the incarnation? You said we're in union with each other because of Christ. So what does it mean for us that, that Christ clothed himself in flesh and walked these mundane shores? Well, I tell you what, um, it means everything <laughs> in one sense. <laughs> there is what is actually our hope for this kind of vision and life in this kind of missional life. It, it, is, it cannot be that we've got the right uh, strategies. We've got the right missional strategies for um, Christian communion and missional outreach. It is that our Lord clothed himself in human flesh for the redemption of the world. For he he came for this redemption. It's impossible apart from him. Right? Since he partook, as the, the pastor says to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter two, two right? Um, of these same things of flesh and blood, that he might destroy the power of the devil, right? that he might liberate all those who were subject, the pastor says, to lifelong slavery to the fear of death. Therefore, right, it is fitting, <laughs> he says, right, um, 
that God should make the foundation, the founder of their salvation, perfect through suffering. Therefore, he's not ashamed to call them brothers. Right? Saying, I will sing of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing a hymn of praise to you. I'll tell of your name to my brothers. That we, that, that Christ clothed himself and has become, therefore, our great high priest. We do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is Hebrews chapter 4, right? Who's been tempted in every respect as we have, yet without sin, right? Therefore, let's draw near to the throne of grace with confidence <laughs> that we might receive grace to help find mercy in our time of need. This is all rooted in the incarnation of Christ. Because he came, because he identified, right? We now have confidence, right? We now have confidence not in ourselves, but in God, right? But in God who raises the dead, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so, and so if we try to manufacture mission, if we try to manufacture communion across lines of difference, by the sole means of our strategies, they are doomed to fail. What, what will keep us together? What will keep us together? What will keep us from retreating into Christian camps of affinity, from, from running away from the hard, impossible task of, I'm not even talking about loving non-Christian neighbors who differ from, I'm talking about loving believers who, who differ radically from us in terms of not just culture and ethnicity, but in terms of perspectives on all kinds of issues. Well, if what you're saying, I mean, if if there have ever been two years to confirm what you're saying, I mean, it feels like the 2020, 2021, those those were those years. <laughs> and, you know, we've I've talked with uh, Colin Hansen. You know, some people say that um, that the church is polarized because the nation's polarized. But Colin makes a compelling case. Well, actually, the church is failing so bad in, in our addressing of these issues and allowing ourselves to be divided, that that's contributing to the division we see in our country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which way is it? Is it? Is it the culture seeping into the church? Or is it the church's failure to be faithful to the full implications of what it means to be citizens of the kingdom that is aiding the fracture and polarization in the culture? I mean, that's the question. And the, what the thing that was compelling to me in the argument that he made is if you look at Christian Twitter over the past few years, it was the, the things that Christians were debating and often not debating charitably, they were consistent, consistently three to six months ahead of Fox News and CNN. Mm, wow. That was, that was a compelling argument to me. So, so here's, here's, you know, I'm not, here to ask y'all questions, but but here's a, here's a question: What is then? Where do we find the church's willingness? What's the root of the church's willingness to weaponize cultural terms like wokeness for for partisan? Points and gains, or to uh, to weaponize for polarization purposes, um, uh, secular ideologies or perspectives like critical race theory that were not designed to say anything to the church or about the church. <laughs> You know, th these are questions that we have to say, well, what's the, why are we, why are we leading with these things? 
when 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 the the pursuit of the issues that relate to justice the call to the to pursue what is good and right for image bearers belongs to the church because of our book and who we are in Christ right so anyway, I, you know, the, the, right? Those. It's an important question. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure the answer is multifaceted. I don't assume to have the perfect answer, but answer, I didn't but, ask the question because I have the answer. Well, and it's, but it's a, it's a. Per, I mean, for the listeners to continue to process this question, but I, I, I do believe on both sides of the argument. But I'm just, I'm just talking to to Christians in America here, especially white Christians. I think there is a real fear of loss of influence and power at play. And, and, you know, when we look at uh, g- the normative life of God's people throughout our history and, and across the global East and global South today, the norm has not been for us to exercise our influence from the seat of power. And, and often when we have, that's not gone well. The norm has been to exercise our influence from the margins. Uh, and and I, I think that what we're experiencing is more of a return to what is normative in, in God's people, going back to Abraham, obviously Daniel, the Israelites, our brothers and sisters in the East now. And, and that's scary. It's scary if you're not used to that. And this is where it intersects so well with missional and confessional. We have to have a robust understanding of a people being God's people living in a a type of exile at all times until Jesus comes back for us to walk into this era of the great dechurching well, because our goal isn't necessarily to win the country back. And I think there's a lot of uh, false understandings of just that phrase in the beginning, but our goal is to build up believers and give a more beautiful picture of, of who we are called to be as believers in this time in this place. So I think it's an amazing, a perfect question to ask. And uh, and I hope others can build uh, build on that question. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, yeah, I, I echo those same sentiments. I, I I I'm struggling with this one deeply. It it's it's just so clear to me that we have the arena and the Constitution to work this out. We have the church and we have the document known as the Bible. And it seems to me that we as the people of God ought to be the most courageous, the most humble, the most willing to lean into these spaces. And, and, even, and even to consider these terms that come from, if you will, a, a secular space, even consider how they can be employed redemptively, right? The old saying goes, the stop clock is right at least twice a day. And, and so, I, and, and I think, I think, of course, you would have a better grasp on this, it seems to me that we're still wrestling with the second commandment. The church in America has long wrestled with the second great commandment. All right. And so we, we've over the years. All right. Do we evangelize a certain people, a certain portion of the population? Are they even human? All right. Well, they're human, but we still don't want to give full citizenship. We, we don't want to give up something that we've gained. And to me, that's rooted in understanding the full implications of the second commandment. Um, It's, you know, again, biblical fidelity requires biblical ethics. And so I think we're struggling with that. And I think of Charles Marsh's book, God's Long Summer, and you think back to 1950s, how is it possible for such great movements around Jesus? People, People hearing the gospel of Jesus preach so clearly articulated so clearly, but still walking out the door, disliking and maybe potentially hating the people that God created. I think there was just a deep emphasis on getting your thoughts right and not your actions. And that's the second commandment. It's just, as long as my soul is okay, it doesn't matter how I treat anyone else. And so I think we're in an age of reckoning um, because the polarization is clear. I mean, those are just things I'm wrestling with along the way of that question you asked. That's right. That's absolutely right. That that such an important point that this is connected to confession and and 
no one, right? I don't, no one would argue or would rightly argue that, um, that, that biblical ethics is interwoven in all of this. And biblical ethics is both confessional and missional, right? It's, it's the ethics of what, what is right. And then what do we do? Right? We do right. <laughs> we do right. Right? We do right. And the, your, your point, Michael, about how we can see the shortfall and shortcomings of so many of those who called in the name of the Lord Jesus in the previous generations who was still willing to uphold and maintain and promote racialized segregation, racialized hierarchy, right? Um, how much the, the, the demands, the mandates to maintain a particular way of cultural being influences the church. And for us, we have to ask the question today, where are those things still happening with us? Mm -hmm. we, we can't act as though, oh, you know, well, that was, well, that was, that was so terrible, man. Back then, you know, I could see, if I, if I was, you know, alive back then, you know, mm -hmm. I would have been, you know, the likelihood is that you'd have probably been going right along with, you know, the program with everybody. So we got to ask it because there, you all know, right, there's a cost to righteousness and holiness. There's a cost to, to declaring what thus says the Lord and living it out. The, God always had witnesses. So, so it was not like in, in era, in bygone eras, in the past few centuries in the United States that every white Christian pastor or leader was a proponent of racial segregation and racial hierarchies. No, those who spoke out against it were willing to pay a cost, and they did, right? But they, but they, they understood that I live, right? We live Coram Dale. <laughs> uh, we live before the face of God. And so, what can man do to me? <laughs> they ask, right? That do we have that kind of willingness today to press against the de demands and the tide of cultural priorities that that are more about the kingdom of darkness than the kingdom of light? So one of the things I've heard you talk about, uh, we've, we have seminary students in our church who rave about what you say is the multifaceted glory of the essence of God and how it is meant to be reflected in the church. Can you flesh that out a little bit? That I've said it already, um, but it is an implication of the Trinity. And so, so we were yeah. made for unity and diversity. And we see this in the scriptures, we, you know, uh, Ephesians 3, Paul talks about the, the manifold wisdom of God <laughs> being revealed, <laughs> right? And that word manifold is, is literally the multicolored <laughs> wisdom, the, right? The multifaceted wisdom of God. And it's not a stretch to say, to say that that has implications for the church, because he's talking to this church about Jew and Gentile being together. And so we we have a love, this is what I'll say, and we'll, I'll let you move on to the next question. We are called to a supernatural love that um, it says, listen, these people are not likely to be together or stay together apart from the power and witness of the Spirit of Christ. Why would they be together? That's what you should see when you look at the church. Why would they be together? It, the only reason we could give is Jesus. 
Yeah. Because they don't fit. So, Doc, one of one phrase you hear come up in the conversation about how the church can and should interact with the world around us is being in the world, but not of the world, which more or less comes from John 17. You've you've touched on this at various points, Uh, but people on one extreme have used it to mean that they should distance themselves from the culture they live in because they're not of the world. And then people on the other extreme desiring to be more contextually connected, maybe over contextualizing, if you will, uh, to the world um, we're sent into have acted, af, af, excuse me, actively become more like the world to minister to it. So can you just help us zero out and, and, and understand what Jesus is saying in John 17 and how understanding and embracing those teachings should drive the mission of the church? Yeah, I, I, that's such an important question. Um, because if we listen to what Jesus is praying, this is John, this is his high priestly prayer. This is Jesus, right? We're, we're getting clued in on his heart in prayer to the Father before his crucifixion. Mm-hmm. And, it, and and it's the key things that he says, right? Um, he says, Father, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, mm-hmm. but that you keep them from the evil one, right? So, so he says, right, they are not of the world, just like I'm not of the world, right? But I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm asking you, they're in the world. So, so keep them from the evil one, right? Um, sanctify them in the truth, he says, for your word is truth. And then he says, as you sent me into the world, so I'm sending them. (laughs) So, so that's the key that we're, yes, we're in it, but not of it. We're in it. And so we will often, if we are faithful to the Lord, we will often look like him in our missional engagement in the world, we will be accused of being a friend of sinners. <laughs> we will be accused of being a, 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 a drunkard, <laughs> right? Just like he, why do you, why do you eat and drink with sinners? Right? We, if we look like our Lord, we will hear the, those accusations from those who say, hey, the way to purity is, is, is no interaction with the fallen world, right? Those are the kind of accusations we'll hear. And at the same time, right, we, we, have, to, we have to guard our own hearts in prayer. We have to, as God's people, this is the importance. This is the importance of, of being rooted and grounded repeatedly in the word of God. This is the importance of faithful Christian community, of us hearing the gospel proclaimed, of us studying the scriptures. How do we get sanctified in the truth? Jesus says, well, to sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so, and so it is, it's again, not a false dichotomy. We're in the world. We're, we're sent. And so it's going to look very much to those who might not want the church to have anything to do with being in the world, like there's compromise because we come alongside and we engage, right? And at the same time, we entrust ourselves to the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that we will, there will be a cost to this engagement. The world will want to reject us as we speak the truth in its midst, right? But we can't speak the truth in its midst unless we're engaged. Amen. Well, so I mean, you said it so well. I, under the with last question, under the banner that we're putting here of dechurching, we we live in the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of our country. We've proven that. That's not being debated. It's just going the opposite direction than the previous largest religious shifts, and, and it is our our opinion, our conviction that uh, that. Part of this is a contributing factor of this is churches 
letting go of either confession or mission. Uh, and that false, it's a false dichotomy, as you said, but, but le- trying to lean more toward one at the expense of the other. So I just want to finish by getting very practical. How, how can we, um, how can we employ what you are saying in the church better? How do we form members and our ministries and worship to do exactly what you're talking about here now? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I, this is how I describe very often the work that we do at Mission to North America. Mission to North America, we serve the Presbyterian Church in America for the cultivation of kingdom advancement, right? We serve the church for this purpose, the outward face of the church. And I say, what we want to see is our ministry practitioners engage the resources of mission to North America as they want to live out their confessional commitments engaging the missional opportunities that the current culture is providing. So we want to combine like our, we want to live out the implications of our confessional commitments missionally. (laughs) So we have to ask certain questions. What are the gospel opportunities being provided to us in our cultural context? We can talk, oh, from a 30,000 foot level in terms of North America, when it's mission to North America, but we have to ask this in our local context. What are the gospel opportunities here in this place that the Lord would have us engaging as we follow him faithfully into this context? There's a, um, there's one example. There's a new study that Barna has, um, released late last year, early 2023, um, on a study of global teens. This study is a combination of Christian and non-Christian teenagers between 13 and 17 years old, uh, almost 25,000 teens from 26 different countries around the world, um, on their views on Jesus, their views on the Bible, and the, their views on kind of social action, okay? And Barna titled this survey, it's three volumes, uh, this study, The Open Generation. So now we're, we're digging into the minds of 13 to 17-year-olds, all right, around the world, right? And so this is, those folks, these are the adolescents and teens coming up, right? And they find that they're drawn to, a couple of things, we can say a lot of it, they're drawn to, um, a merciful and kind-hearted Jesus, <laughs> right? They, they, that appeals to them. And they are very concerned about issues of justice. Now, they, they have limited opportunity to do anything because they're teenagers, <laughs> right? But yeah. it, what their concerns are, right? And they are very they they are very less inclined to be drawn to Jesus as king and ruler and authority, mm. <laughs> right? Now, so we, we get to ask the question, well, what does that mean? What are the opportunities then as we seek to, to engage and disciple the coming generation? How do we help lean into the fact that Jesus is merciful and gracious, that he does love those on the margins, that he is concerned about issues of justice, but he's concerned as the Lord, <laughs> right? And so, so my point is always, always having the kinds of eyes to, to ask questions and depend on the Spirit prayerfully to, to give us um the kind of discernment we need to say, how do we live out our faith in this generation? What are the key concerns of our neighbors that the gospel can answer? And what does it look like for us to be engaging this? As Harvey Kahn's book says, you know, uh, eternal word, changing world, right? His mission, missiological book. 
The word is eternal. The world is always changing. And so we've got to always be seeing how do we bring the eternal word to bear in a changing world in our context. Well, that is so well said, and you set up perfectly. Uh, we only have one episode left that's going to come out after this, and it is going to be on church formation, and it's going to be a live episode at TGC. So I can't, I, I just can't think of a better transition into that than everything that you just said. Dr. Entz, man, thank you. It is always good to be with you and hear from you, and I'm just thankful for all you're doing and all the ways that the, the Lord is using you. Likewise, brothers, a delight to be with y'all. Thanks, Doc. Thanks. Grateful for you.